This episode has been sponsored by my Patreon patron, Stonebone. If you'd like to sponsor an episode, please email me at theillustratedmenagerie at gmail.com and we can get started. Chimere is a distant planet. Although no plants or animals originated there, Chimere's ecosystems are teeming with organisms harvested from Earth, where they then diversify into unique species in this new context. Where and when these harvested occurred is determined by the portal, a hive of indigenous organisms. Harvests are in response to the portal's perception of the ecological health and biodiversity of its territory, called the known world by Chimere's inhabitants. Since megafauna, especially specialized megafauna, are most vulnerable to extinction in changing contexts, niches of these animals have the highest turnover in harvests. Chimere has frequently undergone periods of stability called dynasties by Chimeran naturalists. During dynasties, harvesting rarely if ever occurs. The latest dynasty, the Tyrant Dynasty, was also the longest. Minimal continental drift, a steady climate, and herds of hadrosaurs and titanosaurs all made for a stable foundation during this period. Animals changed and adapted to internal competition, but there were no mass extinctions, and for almost 40 million years, there were no harvests. The northern and eastern continents were in an ecological golden age. This period continued on the eastern continent but change was coming for the northern continent of Nikar. A large continent across the sea, Arvel, was coming eastward swiftly. Ten million years later, a tectonic plate had broken off the polar continent and was coming north, which in modern times is the foundation of Picardia and the southern islands. What happened 30 million years ago as all these plates converged would serve as the precursor to the end of the Tyrant Dynasty 15 million years later. A great volcano, the likes of which Chimere had not seen before or since, erupted on Nikar's southern coast. Although the eastern continent felt its effects, hundreds of plants and animal species were wiped out in the northern continent. Southern Nikar became a wasteland. Once the portal itself recovered from the disaster, a harvest was immediately triggered. By then the flora was recovering, and fauna from the eastern continent had begun to recolonize, but animals were also being collected from North America, the Northern Atlantic, and Eurasia. The largest mammals came through had some initial success, but over time, the flora cultivated by titanosaurs and hadrosaurs, combined with not having natural defenses against larger predators, resulted in their extinction. By then, dinosaurs had fully repopulated, and harvests were not necessary. Although the iconic giants of the Oligocene were extinct, their legacy was far from over. Tyrannosaurs were the preeminent apex predators. They dominated small predatory niches from when they left their mothers at 100 pounds all the way up to 20-ton adults. Hyenodonts experimented with a range of niches, but really shined as semi-aquatic predators, being convergent with otters in many ways. Some retained terrestrial predator roles, but competition from ambush-hunting non-therian mammals eventually got the best of them. The climbing capabilities of Nimravids enabled them to cash prey out of reach of non-therians and tyrants, and they thrived in this niche in enclosed forests. Where titanosaurs went, however, they were much less common since titans keep the forests open, although a clade of Nimravids similar to hyenas and homotherium did make a name for themselves as pursuit predators in open forests. Right off the bat, Intellidons like Archaeotherium proved quite successful. Being highly cursorial and possessing a bone-cracking bite, they competed directly with young tyrants, and the sheer number of young tyrants kept Intellidons in check. Intellidons had to adapt, and two solutions came about. Bruisers that tried to muscle their way into the niche of dominance with mixed results, and the other invested more in being clever and adaptable sacrificing some of their oppressive bite strength for a larger cranium and becoming quite social. These social and cursorial intelligence outcompeted many of the mammal pursuit predators on both continents. Although tyrannosaurs remained dominant, the cockatrices evolving at around the same time put further pressure on these intelligence to be intelligent. 
Herbivorous ungulates did quite well as small browsers and brazers. Peccaries, small rhinos, and robust camels spread throughout the northern and eastern continent. Being small generalists proved highly successful. Although they did not reach the sizes of these clades as they did on Earth, they were highly successful during the dynasty. Adapiform primates were also introduced during this time. These were more intelligent and agile than arboreal nontherians of the time. Some clung to their original niche in dense forests, although these were few and far between as titanosaurs had by then reclaimed the northern continent. A clade of gliding adapiforms evolved in response, adapting to the open forests for more efficient travel. Another radiation of adapiforms became cursorial, resembling baboons through convergent evolution. Burrowing beavers and pangolins were among the smaller fauna harvested, both of which we've already discussed in previous episodes that I encourage you to check out if you haven't already. Many birds were also harvested, but pirates were by far the most successful. Enantiornithian birds had a firm hold on most avian niches, but parrots shined in their adaptability, becoming ecologically flexible while many introduced birds went extinct. Some took to the sea, specializing in crustaceans. These sea parrots are still widespread in Chimere. Others became raptorial, converging with eagles and falcons, where they remained dominant outside the known world, although true raptors have outcompeted them in the known world because of the sort of invasive advantages we've discussed in the past. Their flexible and powerful beaks also lent themselves to scavenging. Fruit and nut specialists also evolved from this stock. Perhaps most surprising was a parrot that reached Arvel, which at the time was still quite isolated. The trees were only populated by small mammals that were swiftly outcompeted. These parrots radiated into a range of arboreal niches. One group became flightless and truly massive, converging with apes like chimpanzees as robust arboreal omnivores. After the dynastic extinction and the inclusion of Arvel into the known world, cat-like predators and raptors became more common, and drove most of these flightless parrots to extinction. In modern Chimere, this clade is survived by the Rukal, its largest representative and a notorious ambush hunter, hunting big cats with seeming retributive enthusiasm. Bathornithids were another initially successful bird clade. These North American terror birds, as they are often called, are indeed related to forest rackets and share many traits with them. Competition with juvenile tyrants and the newly evolved cockatrice put pressure on them to be small and generalist hunters, a niche they still occupy to this day. Although there were a few exceptions here and there, generally animals that came through this harvest were relegated to the shadows, and the tyrant dynasty continued on. No further harvest occurred, as staples of the dynasty repopulated the region and ecological stability resumed with a few new cast members in the mix. Satisfied with the health of its territory, the portal returned to a recuperating stasis. While there were many factors leading to the dynastic extinction 15 million years ago, continued volcanic activity in southern Nikar was among them. This series of volcanoes was not at the singular magnitude as the one that triggered the Oligocene harvest, but they were more frequent and shaped much of modern Chimere, including the southern islands and much of the Crescent. Their disappearance led to an explosion of closed forests, which resulted in habitat loss for many animals specialized for the tyrant gardens, and a subsequent fluctuation in climate culminated in a mass extinction. In the aftermath, small dinosaurs and mammals were on a fairly even playing field in reclaiming the mantles left by the tyrants, titanosaurs, horned dinosaurs, and hadrosaurs. Although parxosaurs and titanosaurs became dominant herbivores, and megaraptorans took on the title of apex predator, mammals claimed a wide range of niches. In the ecologies of the known world, very few of these oligocene infiltrators are found to this day. The kochu, a small nimrvid, along with flying lemurs, fossorial beavers, a small bathornithid, and the intelodont nahashet are a few examples of survivors, but most of them have been outcompeted. The constant influx of invasive species, in particular the diseases that they bring, have meant that most mammal niches are occupied by more recent fauna. 
This is not to say that more recent animals are in any way inherently superior, just that invasive species often have a lot of advantages in this constantly fluctuating context. On the eastern continent, a very different convention is held. In broad terms, dinosaurs still define much of the landscape, holding a majority of large animal niches. Of the mammals, nearly half are multi-tuberculates, a non-therian clade which has thrived on this continent. A few animals, like hyenas, have done well for more recent harvests, but most therian mammals are from the Oligocene harvest. Naturalists of the known world are generally familiar with the flora and fauna of the eastern continent's west coast. Crossing the ocean comes with many dangers, and the continent is decidedly hostile, so no permanent settlements have been made by chimerans, but they do know many of the animals there. Adapiform primates remain in three clades, arboreal animals in closed forests, cursorial primates on the prairies, and gliders in the Titan Gardens. They are usually translated as lemurs, even though they are not part of this group, but it helps naturalists differentiate them from monkeys. Herds of cursorial rhinos are quite common. They are among the best animals at digesting the low-nutrient housey grass, having evolved alongside it. Oligocene harvest camels came in a wide range of sizes and niches. Largest and most horrid is a camel translated as catablepus after the similar animal described by Pliny the Elder, a sluggish beast with a rancid breath and heavy head. Those they look upon are killed. The catablepus has no such gaze, but their spit can cause blindness, and they are generally quite aggressive. These herding animals are herbivores, preferring to tackle tough vegetation, but they are known to kill and eat small game seemingly without provocation. Thick, loose hide, especially on the belly and flank, affords them excellent protection against rear attacks from Megaraptorans and Dromaeosaurs, and with foul spit and a bone-cracking bite, few predators want to attack a herd head-on. Along the coast, Nimavids are potent ambush predators. The largest, called the Dire Panther, approaches the sizes of Earth Tigers. They are proficient grapplers and specialize in ungulate prey. Hyenodonts are quite successful on the eastern continent. Some are fully aquatic. The freshwater Renzuyo of the known world has a cousin on this continent that are massive and ferocious ambush predators. For their speed, armor-piercing bite, and a penchant to surplus kill, the indigenous peoples of the wetlands fear this beast above all others. Borophaging dogs, or bone-crushing dogs, were small game specialists at the time of the Oligocene harvests. They never reached the impressive size of their earth cousins, but the panther hound is proof that they should not be overlooked. These dogs are in many ways similar to doles, living in vast, complex, and coordinated packs. They swarm prey, dealing vicious bites and fighting with dramatic ferocity despite their small stature. Although they have done fairly well in the known world, being found throughout the Housie Prairie, this genus is much more common on the eastern continent, being the dominant small canid in both open forests and prairie. The largest and most diverse predator group of this era are the Entelodonts. A clade of basal robust members are highly successful hunters and scavengers. Perhaps the most surprising, though, are the lineage of small social omnivores, which exploded in diversity after the dynastic extinction. Their vocal range is quite wide, and sacrificing bite strength for intelligence has manifested in surprising auditory mimicry. The Nahashet of the known world can even mimic phrases they hear, using human voices to lure prey, and it is said that their cousins domesticated by indigenous peoples on the eastern continent can even speak with their riders, although this rumor is unconfirmed. The largest terrestrial mammalian predator to ever appear on Earth or Chimere is also from this small cursorial clade. The Bokodu is the last species of this giant genus. Females are stationary territorial omnivores. Males can weigh up to 10 tons and are nomads who wander the prairies, with centennial bulls knowing most of the continent. Many other animals were brought through during this time that I will cover in greater detail in future episodes, but I hope you've enjoyed this look at some of the major players in the known world and beyond.
Thank you so much to Stonebone for sponsoring this episode. I had a ton of fun making the artwork for it. As I continue to venture further from the known world, you'll see the animals become increasingly unfamiliar since their common ancestors are further back in time. If any of you want to sponsor an episode, it's $100 for a single species and $300 for a clade, biome, or harvest episode like this. Thank you so much to my patrons. Your support is how I'm able to invest the time to make these episodes, and I'm thrilled at the reception. Thank you also to everyone for watching. The ad revenue from YouTube is extremely helpful. That's all for today. I hope you have enjoyed, and have a fantastic day. Cheers, folks!